Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for, for coming today. Um, my topic uh, is unapologetically focused on the fictional landscape that we have created with notions of the artificial person. Um, and it feels to me that that is something that we uh, take for granted in culture, and especially, and that becomes an especially important uh, illusion uh, if you are unaware of what this fictional vocabulary is doing and how much it circulates. Um, for example, you might be able to ask a six-year-old child, what is a robot, and they know. Right? How do they know? Where does this cultural training come from, and what does it actually do? And if a six-year-old child knows, then any one of us who is much older than that, uh, or maybe a little older than that, um, uh, has such cultural training in the assumptions, the historical legacies, the conditioning that has been created uh, about the figure of the robot, the figure of the artificial person, um, the, the, the kind of uh, continuity we have with these cultural assumptions, and an enormous range of cultural productions. Uh, fictions, photographs, movies, um, uh, strange illustrations. And in fact, the question of what is a robot is very easy to answer if you start from that cultural point of view. Because uh, the cultural point of view can include everything. These are robots, right? Both the toy and the x-ray art project of the toy are recognizably robots and would be recognized by somebody who sits, right? Uh, these are also robots. These are art projects that are based on assemblage uh, and are based on a kind of a sense of the, the beauty and the material presence and the evocativeness of objects, right? They already have a kind of face. They already have expression. They already have presence. Um, they don't actually need any other Gothic continuum in order to exhibit these things, right? They already speak. Um, and they speak in a way that participates in what, at some point, we have to then abstract as the definition of the robot or the cultural uh, dissemination of the concept of an artificial being that is constructed, made out of disparate parts, and loosely anthropomorphic. And I say loosely anthropomorphic because, in fact, to reference the human form, you need very little. Figures can do it, a plug can do it, the right photograph in the right angle of a certain object or a certain configuration of uh, you know, stones on the ground can do it. We're so wired to recognize a human form that actually attaining the human form is, is, is not big potatoes. Right? Like to, to say this is an imitation of the human form is actually the least interesting thing that you can say about a robotic construct. Uh, it, the, the rest is a lot more cultural and a lot more specific. For example, the, the, the previous robots exhibited a complete self-conscious uh, absorption of the notion of the robot. And then we get into more and more complicated materials when we try to figure out how other objects use that aura, that cultural uh, dispersed cultural production. For example, the, the robots that are real robots and that are working right, in an automotive factory, for example, are not the first thing that the six-year-old is going to paint when I say paint me a robot. right? They are not participating in the same easy way to the fiction, the cultural fiction, the cultural disseminated notion of the robot as, uh, as the tiny toy. Um, and then you have products from particular companies like Asimo uh, who are using that, that uh, aura of the robot in a way uh, in order to promise innovation, in order to promise a company that, that speaks to the future, and in order to promise something that is actually quite fictional. Because in fact, Asimo is not a robot, it's uh, 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 remotely uh, moved, uh, remotely uh, 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 used, sorry, what is it? Control. Control. Remotely controlled. And there are two teams of controllers, one for the upper body and one for the lower body. The lower body is where you have the real technology research, because the lower body is about bipedal motion, and it has incredible complexity. How something moves, how it can actually uh, balance its weight, how it can respond to differences in texture. The upper body is fetish. The upper body is not necessary at all except as PR. And in fact, Asimo's job is PR, right? It does the, and most, most uh, the robotic projects that have this anthropomorphic, fetishistic relationship to imitation, usually their only job is PR. Uh, they don't actually perform labor. The robots that don't have that connection perform quite a lot of labor. Um, these, for example, are incredibly successful robotic projects. These are palletizing robots. The robots that create the things that we recognize that often come up in your house when you're doing construction. Um, and, um, and they create a new type of factory which is uh, about surrounding the robot with all of its useful ergonomic kind of uh, useful functions. Very successful, uh, can transform complete industries. 
In fact, this type of robotics is transforming the biotechnology industry now because uh, you have like, you know, a thousand little pipettes of a particular mix that have to be moved from one place to another under temperature and cleanliness conditions that have to be shaken for a certain number of seconds and then moved again. That's a great job for a robot. <laughs> Fabulous job. It's precise. It's repeatable. Uh, and again, no six-year-old would ever paint this as a robot today, right? Actually, in fact, most people wouldn't recognize it at all. So it's funny to me to think about how the aura of the robot in culture is a lot easier to recognize in fictional objects that have nothing to do with robotics. And then to also see the counter problem, which is that actual robotics problems are sometimes plagued by this aura, don't know how to negotiate it unless they negotiate it in these anthropomorphic, specific, imitated ways or as PR. Right? Which, you know, we have to start becoming a little self-conscious about how that works, how that functions, what it does, why it makes sense. Right? I am completely in sympathy with the scientists who have to pers uh, present their work in these uh, old-fashioned terms. Right? It would be nice to figure out what might be alternative terms for us to be able to do this. When you have the robot rovers on Mars, you don't get a sudden uh, narrative about how the robots have colonized Mars. We have the massive projection of human intensity that we are on Mars. None of the fictional components of uh, the robots versus humans, people uh, being supplanted by machines, none of this pertain when you have such a project. So what happens there? The mediation that the machine enables becomes completely transparent. We are on Mars, and this robotic point of view becomes our point of view. And, the, and then the robot becomes a completely useful extension of human ego, and it doesn't actually have the conflicts that other people might recognize or the gothic components of difference. They become a, a tool, they become a projection, and they are, again, very working robots that actually have extended beyond the limits of what people thought they would do uh, on Mars. One of my issues, then, is to think about how the, the figure of the artificial person, the figure of the mechanical body, the figure of the uh, robotic body, is so culturally dispersed and to think about this interplay between reality and fiction. Um, my, my work has focused a lot on trying to figure out how to break out of the either 80s, 90s technoculture vocabulary or the 19th, 20th century Gothic vocabulary, right? How does that vocabulary create the contemporary figure of the artificial person? Um, and also out of the uh, long uh, early modernity vocabulary about the scientific revolution. And so I'm going further and further back in time. You can choose your discipline, right? Every discipline chooses the beginning point, and therefore the discipline is dominated by particular metaphors. Um, and so and after the early science vocabulary about the technological revolution, we still see that the vocabulary in which we, if we describe these figures has to do with a type of reality component, that the issue is that they become real, or there's something about them becoming technologically feasible or possible. At the time, and you say, actually, it sounds like these are the oldest thing in the book, a kind of an artificially constructed figure that uh, that is similar to people, but not exactly. It just sounds like origin stories. It sounds like mythologies and, <coughs> and uh, um, uh, spectacles of the gods creating the earth or the gods creating people. What are the connections with some of those older texts? So my book started out of thinking about inventing that longer span and in the process recognizing much deeper roots for the discourse of the artificial body that we have now. And also, certain things that we still seem to be lingering on, but actually we should figure out how to revise. And one of them is my favorite problem, which is the, the imitation component, right? The idea that uh, the desire for this discourse is how to imitate uh, the, the human, right? And then everything is hinging on that. You either imitate too well or not well enough. You succeed and you fail based on that concept of imitation. It's totally domineering as a concept. Um, and there is no other field in contemporary humanities where imitation functions as a theoretical principle. You cannot go to an art department and say, oh, this Picasso is beautiful, it looks, it's, and think about that you're going to do Picasso in terms of imitation. People will laugh you out of the room. Right? So it's a very strange, strange uh, stranglehold that imitation has in this field. I think that it is also a symptom. So as a cultural critic, I feel like I'm a little bit of an archaeologist, or sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit on another planet. Like I'm looking at this and saying, oh, I see. Everybody's doing imitation. What's up with that, right? Um, and then the imitation component, I think, um, limits us to a very modern sensibility that, uh, that uh, somehow seems to be related to the advent of uh, uh, binary oppositions, self and other, uh, Cartesian dualism, all of those things wrapped up together, and we are still uh, in the stereotypes of those, 
even though a lot of our cultural productions already have an alternative vocabulary, which is actually pre-modern, and in which imitation is not the operative principle, but motion is. Some of the situated robotics that you guys were talking about yesterday and today, are, you can really see the difference, in my view, between projects that are motivated by a fetishistic interest in imitation, to thinking about other principles, like motion or like modeling. Like to say I'm going to model the function of something is not the same as to say I'm going to imitate the function of something. Imitation is so much more limited than modeling, analogy, uh, um, the, the kind of geometric expansion that those, that those words allow. Science fiction again. There is a type of uh, determinism that happens in relation to the embodiment of the artificial person. The artificial person uh, is expressing a kind of performative version of humanity. When you can imagine, and again, I'm in fiction, when you can imagine any body you want, the kinds of bodies you do imagine have a lot of excess meaning about what you think about bodies, what you project of your bodies, how you've allowed body embodiment and bodiness to transform in the fiction. And you have very simple definitions, and again, these are always revisable uh, because cultural productions evolve, but somehow they seem to hinge on something specific. Robots, which are usually oversized, uh, sometimes me me metallic or they might be made of synthetic materials, but they project the type of otherness, right? You can tell what they are just by looking at them, they're robots. Uh, androids, which have a kind of a hybrid sensibility, sometimes they might have green skin, or they might have problem with logical propositions or problem with humor or other cultural elements. Cyborgs, which seems to pass completely for human, and passing is part of the issue, uh, but they, see, they still reveal a type of alienation from the human, sometimes in the case of the Terminator, because they are too cruel, or are relentless, or they can't stop, or they have too much purpose. But both androids and cyborgs also, because they can pass for human even marginally, they also become really interesting figures as agents, because they can be manipulated, or they can actually be too obedient to their mission, if their mission is to you know, find John Connor and kill him. <laughs> and then objects that, uh, artificial uh, entities that do not have a body, have the same problem with embodiment, which is that by not being embodied specifically somewhere, they might in fact be everywhere. And this is a strange resurgence in contemporary AI thinking, including transcendence, of a type of 80s fearfulness about networks, which is that either the embodied entity in the computer system is uh, uh, treating the computer system as just a transparent medium, and then there is some hacker somewhere or cyber criminal somewhere that's just using the medium in order to get to your computer, or it is an emergent uh, intelligence inside the system, and that's even scarier because you cannot control anything and somehow they control everything. And then it becomes a criminalization of all of the things that we have made controllable, right? All of the smart objects, it's not that the, my phone is going to kill me, it's that my phone is hackable by somebody who wants to kill me. But that changes the problem of intention and it changes the question of, of agency. That there is The fact that there might be a human on the other side of the line changes what we think about in terms of the artificiality and its, uh, and its counterparts. There's a lot of contemporary movies. I'm not going to talk about all of them. There is a constant recycling in contemporary culture, partly because of the way that the film industry and television industry work right now. Partly, I think a lot of these are motivated by the fact that very, very good special effects are becoming easier and cheaper. And so you can actually have even a modest project on TV, have fantastic special effects, and then they themselves create plot lines that, that uh, fall in love with this notion of artificiality. And so you have more and more of that. Um, the reason which I think the question is, uh, is, is important to think about now is to think about fictions of the artificial person and how they change, but also to think about whether they change and what parts change. Uh, and then the connection between reality and fiction is also extremely complicated. In something like gravity, for example, NASA engineers were consulted about the project of gravity. The same is true about Interstellar and the Martian. And the Martian was famously uh, criticized at some point for being like a, a NASA project that just somehow became a movie. Uh, <laughs> because if you go to the NASA website, you'll see that they actually have a whole set about, okay, the project about going to Mars, according to the Martian, is that possible? What parts are possible? And in fact, so much of it is possible because it was the NASA blueprints that ended up giving the action to the movie. Um, so some cases you have science informing science fiction. In Gravity, for example, one of my pet peeves of science fiction, which is that they have explosions in space that have a lot of sound, uh, that, that, that doesn't happen in Gravity, it's silent, okay, finally. Um, or you have things in which, uh, and a lot of technology people love this idea, something in science fiction becomes true, right? So the communicators from Star Trek become our phones or our uh, Bluetooth, and then it, become, it makes a retro cycle where then you can actually buy uh, a stylized uh, 
um, you know, Star Trek uh, Bluetooth thing that actually is a contemporary technology, but in the retro remediation kind of vocabulary of all technologies. Um, and then the, the, the common claims that we see also have to be somehow made a little more subconscious. <laughs> the common claim that robots are real now or soon will be real. The robot is always a connection to futurity, there's some future horizon. Um, that the robots of science fiction are becoming real now, right, a link between science fiction and, and reality. And that fict fictions of robots inspire actual robotics, and we we're having a conversation about this uh, last night. So my question is to look at backwards. Do the actual applications of robotics, do they change the fiction? Right? And the fiction has a lot more longevity than most of these projects. The fiction, in fact, is a revelation of just how paradoxical contemporary, how paradoxical culture is in general. Popular culture is a very bizarre product. On the one hand, it is incredibly responsive. Uh, we are the collective producers and consumers of popular culture, and if we are worried about something, like genetically modified foods, for example, it emerges in popular culture immediately, very, very quickly. So as a, as a collective product, popular culture is very responsive. On the other hand, however, nothing ever goes away. So you actually have uh, patterns, styles, formulas, genres from 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years ago, and they're just as recognizable and just as uh, available and just as functional in popular culture as they were a long time back. In fact, sometimes more so because we have better social effects and better media. Um, so the question then of thinking about this in long swaths of time really makes sense for me. And here I'm going to give you a little bit of my conclusions just so that you have a sense of what you're listening for as I'm going to do a lot more historical material later. Some of the things that I'm observing in all of these movies that are just coming out and they are hypotheses. I am at the mercy of whatever the next TV series will do. Again, I'm always post facto. I'm an archaeologist. I'm thinking about what they have done, how to make meaning out of it. Something about the us versus them narrative has been changing. Uh, and I will show you some information about this in terms of contemporary movies. That narrative, I think, was motivated by a very specific uh, dependence on notions of the modern Western subject on oppression and the notions of the subject not being actually a stable entity but being an entity that gets adjudicated, right? The definition of the person is about conferring personhood, not recognizing intrinsic personhood. It's too legalized, very legalized. And this is why it makes so much sense to think about the function of something like slavery in the formation of that subject because this is how you can then take away humanity and give it back as if it is just an overlay. Right? It isn't about an intrinsic recognition of something embodied. Aristotle would have been freaking out about this because for him, all of these things are embodied. They cannot really be separated out. They're not just something that you put on as today you're a citizen, tomorrow you're not. Today you are a human, tomorrow you're not. Right? It cannot really be taken out. Um, so what we see is a very intense exacerbation of the 20th century, mid-20th century pattern of existential interrogation. Am I human? What makes me human? How do I... I don't feel human enough, I feel like a robot, I'm being roboticized, but all in terms of existential rather than social and labor-related questions. So instead of being artificial slaves, for example, we have people who have been caught, Westworld is a good example, they have been caught in a web in which they are being submitted to forms of traumatization or they are in a quest for finding a deeper, more important understanding of themselves as who they are, and the concept of artificiality somehow functions very intensely in these types of existential narratives. Um, some robot fiction seem to be informed by actual science, others are totally immune, uh, and the actual science becomes a matter of mise-en-scene, and I'll show you an example, an example of that. Uh, and then because we have certain things that are actually practical, some of the spectrum of phantasmatic robotic action is limited. So you cannot actually make a movie right now in which your phone is trying to kill you. Right? And I have a test case towards the end of the talk about a movie like Demon Seed, right? a movie from 1975 or 77, where the house is, um, the, the, it's kind of a horror film and I don't know why it even needs computers and stuff, but it's a guy, a scientist, he has made his whole house a smart home, this is the 70s, he has little screens and surveillance cameras everywhere, and of course he's also working on an AI program, the AI operates the house, but the AI gets an idea. <laughs> the AI wants to become human, the AI wants to be embodied, and he basically takes his wife hostage, impregnates her with some men, some bizarre mix of his genes or his information with, with her genes in order to create a new being, which is himself, and it comes out slightly metallic, which nobody knows how that happened. Um, you know, why is it metallic at all? And it says, I am alive. <laughs> so, so in the 70s, this uses the concept of the network house as a horror principle. Now we actually can have totally networked houses, 
But in fact, and how would you make the movie now? And I don't know that you could make the movie now unless you either go back to the Gothic principle in which you invent a completely fictional AI who wants to be master of the world. So that's the same thing as has always been. Or if you invent a person who basically has better access to hacking into your house, in which case the fact, the fact that the house is a smart house isn't the issue. You have just made the house more hackable. It's a question of security, and that not intention. Right? It's, a, it's not that some, your house is trying to kill you, it's that your house becomes a means, a tool, for somebody else's suffering uh, criminality. Um, the other thing that's, so, the, so robotic action is a little limited, like you cannot just in, invent the, the phone that, that controls the world, you have to invent something else that either becomes again the Gothic or is something new. Um, the, the, also the most important thing here is that responsivity is changing. A lot of the definitions of the person that you would read in classic philosophy 101 things about people being, the definition of humanity being related to responsiveness, mutual recognition, uh, some of that stuff is actually very easy to do for smart objects. Right? Your car can recognize you're coming because you have a sensor. So your car becomes a responsive object. Does that have anything to do with consciousness? No. Why? Because our definition of consciousness now is moving in reaction to the applications that are possible with smart objects. We do not actually let that boundary collapse. There is frisson there. Like there's a lot of edginess there. Is the boundary collapsing? But we actually, if you look at popular culture, again, as a collective product, the, we don't actually let the boundary collapse. We move it somewhere else. Where is the boundary moving? It moves a lot more towards the body experience right now. There's a lot more about body function. So you can be smart all day long, house, but, right? You can't sweat. I don't know what it will be. But, uh, but there's a lot more about embodied function. There's a lot more about animality. There's a lot more about survival principles, right? And it is a very similar thing to what happened with a Cartesian interpretation of action, thought, soul, uh, living. Uh, Descartes, in a completely horrible simplification, basically said, sure, all of these different beings are alive, but being alive doesn't matter. What matters is rational thought. Uh, whereas in the 20th century and, and later, in terms of computers, uh, cyborgs, robots, all they have is rational thought, so that cannot really be enough, right? And so we have the emergence of ever more embodied secret places where a different kind of being exists. Some of them might be psychological, right? A secret space inside the self which is not ruled by logic or reason. And you are the most authentic self, that's the psychoanalytic principle, right? Nobody talks about it as mechanism, but it is actually a mechanism, a type of embedded deep mechanicity. You are most authentically yourself when you are not aware that you are acting, right? You're like, why do I keep dating the same person? <laughs> same kind of person. And why am I doing that? That is the moment in which you are acting in a very authentic, psychoanalytically speaking, way because you are not aware. You're just impulsive. You're just representing a drive. Um, and so thinking about the boundary changing away from responsivity, away from the notion of intelligence, away from the notion of intelligence, especially as something disembodied. Uh, and here, parenthesis, this is where the popular culture is already going. But when you look at things like this that, again, are very massive and very distributed, you see all of these things always floating around all the time. I am cutting through in order to tell you what I think is going on. But the, 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 the fantasies of disembodiment, of unfettered consciousness, of transposing consciousness in the network, that stuff is everywhere. That is the stuff that is replicating and repeating elements of popular culture that have been quite familiar and specific desires about what to do with this material, what to do with these fictions. Um, and the desires are eloquent, but they are not really where the fiction is going or where the culture is going. So for example, something like Real Steel, which is a movie that is based on a Twilight Zone episode uh, from uh, the early 60s, 62 or 63, uh, which, is, which was just called Steel, in which uh, a human trainer in a world when, where robots are boxers, a human trainer realizes that his boxer is malfunctioning, and he himself takes the place of the boxer. Human boxing is outlawed because the robots are so much more powerful. And he somehow survives three rounds with an artificial robot. And it's about the victory of the human spirit and also the kind of absolute equivalence between working class masculinity and the object that is replacing that working class masculinity, right? The man and the robot are similar in such a way that he can become the robot uh, uh, and, and that he already reveals that he has already been roboticized by his culture. In the contemporary movie, there is a motion capture component there where basically the human trainer is the trainer and the robot is basically imitating his actions. The robot is being programmed through embodied um, motion capture technology, but the robot isn't necessarily an intuitive fighter after that point. The robot is just replacing a program. 
This is fascinating because actually training is like a programming of your body, of your muscles. Um, it creates muscle memory, and it also operates according to these secret sp spaces that I was talking about. Uh, Bruce Lee apparently famously said, uh, when you are a good fighter, your hand doesn't, I don't hit, he said, it hits all by itself. Right? So the most authentic and, and um, uh, appropriate action is when it is not a thinking action, when it is just your body acting. Um, and so with, the two, with these two figures, however, all of the knowledge about, the intuitive knowledge about training and about boxing is in the human, and it is about kind of creating an imitation, uh, not an imitation, a transfer of that as program uh, into the machine. The machine is not, does not ever become aware, conscious, or anything more than an appliance that can actually do the range of motions that he can. In something like Westworld, what we have is what I was saying before about the mise-en-scene of realistic science. Everything that you see here, including a KUKA robot, right? This is, this is totally real. It exists now, uh, although they don't make them white. They make them orange, they make them yellow, because they have to be visible in the factory floor. Um, but the whole sequence is supposed to be black and white in the credits, and so that's why this is white. Um, you have the, the KUKA robot, you have um, uh, a lot of 3D printing technology, imagined technology. Of course, this creates a lot of cognitive problems for me, because can you 3D print to move? Right? Can you, can you 3D print joints, muscles, and um, cartilage? And then imagine, out of the same material, out of one material, and imagine that that material will then have flexibility in the places you want. So. I, I, you know, yeah, I, I nerd out about things like this. Um, so, th so there are a lot of really strange assumptions, and the assumptions flow from what we want the discourse to do, which is we want it to give us spectacles like this, even though they have nothing to do with the state of realistic knowledge or the state of scientific knowledge, or even basic mechanical knowledge, right? Uh, that joints might have to be 3D printed out of a different material than, than other things that support them. Um, that we want the spectacle, in fact, we want the spectacle of a slightly flayed person, we want a spectacle of concentric circles in which a person is made out of bones and then uh, nerves and then muscles and then skin. And this is exactly the structure of quite a lot of artificial fictions uh, from Vesalius up until the present. Um, and we want the body to be in, in some way understandable as constructed and not as uh, grown or born or intricately related uh, uh, in terms of parts. And then the narrative components that are completely old-fashioned, but also have interesting re re revisions uh, of uh, the narrative of existential quest or the narrative of consciousness. In uh, Westworld, for example, what these uh, hosts are experiencing is much more realistically portrayed as personality as software. Personality as something that is programmable and as something that gets downloaded, that has builds, that has bugs, that has to go back to the next and last available build. Right, all of this vocabulary is very present uh, in the story, even though what the story also contains is a vocabulary in which the self is made out of trauma and out of abuse, right? Because all of this, the, the bug that gets added into the system is memory, that the, the, the fantasy of Westworld is that you can do whatever you want to these human-like beings, but then they get wiped clean at night. But when they actually start remembering, they keep having these constant flashes of all the abuse they have experienced. And that is supposed to also be giving them the complexity of a contemporary consciousness, a contemporary subjectivity. All of the mise en scene of the discourse itself, of having cabinets of curiosities, uh, having all kinds of 19th century objects, having vocabulary from the original Westworld from the 70s, um, all of the objects that are now becoming part of the what a contemporary strange alchemical scientist might want. Um, uh, puppets, it's like a whole list. Puppets, uh, anthropomorphic <laughs> objects, uh, you know, little figurines, all of that stuff exists always in them, as and masks. Um, and so this is kind of like the referentiality to all of the other previous artificial people stories. Um, and then we have uh, a lot of the vocabularies of good, it's moving. Um, a lot of the vocabularies of the, the incongruous interactivity of these things of somebody who is only half made could be moving, uh, of the contrast between the organic here in the horse and the artificial with the robots, and the idea that people would be interrogating each other, and that you have a layering of like a video game structure really, in which you have Westworld, and then you have the world of the controllers, and then you have an imaginary other world that is controlling that world. It's as if the, the problem of Westworld is not enough to actually create a paranoid enough structure. <laughs> and you have to make more and more layers of paranoia in order for it to work. 
and even the narrative of I think I think I'm I'm remembering something which means that my world is constructed, which is staged at the level of the hosts, has to also be replicated at the level of the humans who also don't know what their position is in the social system and who also worry about that. And then if one of them is an existential quest at the level of identity, the second is also an existential quest at the level of uh, systems of, of governance and systems of power, right? And, but every level at some point has the same viral question. Who am I? Why am I here? What is the problem here? Um, and then, of course, these kinds of scenes in which you have a person that gets dehumanized uh, uh, or you have an object that gets personified and those things are dynamically connected uh, to see the, 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 the radical violence on the body and to also think at that same time that, of course, she doesn't feel it, of course, she doesn't. It's fine. This is totally normal for that representation. Um, similarly to questions of um, the, the spectacularity about uh, nudity and about dehumanization in relation to nudity and almost as zombie-ish, as zombies there or other. So one of the things that I wanted to do with my book is to try to take into consideration these aspects of the discourse, which is, first of all, to think about artificial people as a discourse, right? To think about something that has formation. Um, and to think about its structural logic, to think about how it functions in culture. I think that one of the things that I did that, that to me changes the vocabulary is not to connect it to contemporary technoculture or technology in general, but to think about it as transhistorical and much more related to uh, cultural uh, aspects, cultural desires, and philosophical concepts rather than a particular contemporary moment. And I decided to do it in a very structuralist way. Actually decided as a euphemism. I ended up doing it in a very structuralist way. That's why somehow we need it. Um, and, and focused on four specific ingredients that come up again and again in these stories. So basically I followed the stereotypes. It would be bugging me and it happened again and again and again. You could not get out of them. Every time a new movie comes out, like Ex Machina, I go to the film and I'm like this. It's like, is this going to be good money? Oh, it looks like my, oh no, oh well, and they did something new. I'm just, I'm so happy if they have done something that is a reaction to this very, very strong hold of this stereotypical vocabulary. Um, the, the four ingredients play very interestingly with time. The, some of the oldest ingredients that come out of uh, origin stories and mythology are about how artificial people are made, how they are born, especially that they are born adult. This is the most specific characteristic that is almost impossible to counteract. Even in stories that have artificial children, which are very, very few, the, the whole uh, conceptualization of the artificial body is about a body that is unchanging, that cannot grow. Um, and so there's a lot about body function in these, uh, in these stories. To also think about mechanicity, that the body is mechanical, not as related to a contemporary vocabulary mechanicity, but related to an ancient vocabulary of the body, in which mechanical metaphors, if you look at Aristotle, if you look at medieval philosophers, mechanical metaphors are incredibly useful at describing the body. About how these ancient ingredients get retranslated in modernity into the vocabulary, is this in a way? Uh, into the vocabulary of um, um, uh, both a kind of mechanical body that has become uh, uh, instrumentalized, right? So it's not about the mechanicity of my own body, my autonomic functions, the fact that I, I'm not thinking about breathing, I'm not thinking about uh, fighting a, a virus or whatever. I'm not thinking about uh, my, my hormones. That autonomic body is already a mechanical component of the body. But that becomes translated in modernity into something about external control and something about oppression. And so the, that is an interesting translation. And then and the artificial birth becomes also the baseline for narratives of existential cybernetic experience because it's always about recognizing your position in the world and it's always about finding yourself reborn adult to see what the world is. So I'll talk a little bit about what these different ingredients do. Uh, the reason I call it anatomy of a robot is because we always like looking inside these things. Somehow the spectacle of the body that looks human and then opens up into completely different ingredients never goes away, never gets stale. People love it. I love it. Uh, in this particular case, somehow the cowboy hat has to stay on. The face can go, uh, but the cowboy hat has to stay on. And this anatomical gesture continues in the design of people who have particular transparent body parts so that we can see inside. It's a surprising um, gesture because in a way it is Designing a body whose interior is supposed to be the alternative, the opposite to the human interior, which is messy and gooey and has too many body fluids. Understandable and clean and sparkling and full of understandable things. And yet somehow we still want to see that uh, as if it is also a source of mystery, a new place of mystery and mystification. 
Um, so in thinking about morphologies, I was trying to look for the stereotypes, for the story patterns. I was also trying to be more specific and more precise about the terms that we use to describe these different things. I was thinking about uh, culture in all of its messiness as a deep and important archive. Uh, and also thinking about recognizing the difference between stories and objects. And if I have any advice for those of you starting out right now uh, on thinking about this, just remember this difference. Stories are actually part of the Gothic continuum uh, of um, a 19th, a 18th, but also 19th, 20th century, 21st century science fiction, in which you do not have to have an artificial person at all in your life or a robotic being in your life, but you can read all about the kind of uh, energies uh, between an inanimate and an animate object. And representational media are fantastic at this. You go to a puppet show and the puppet seems to feel and makes you cry. How did that happen? How did that work? Of course, you know it's artificial, but that projection is part of what representational media are able to do, to actually create the sense of aliveness, of things coming to life, the whole metaphor of animation that is f fundamental in representation. Objects don't do that. The phone is the phone. The phone is not suddenly going to be uh, transformed into something else, the way that a phone in a store can be transformed into something else. But my phone actually also have, has uh, allows me to have experiences of interactivity and presence that are actually embodied and physical. So for example, in the example yesterday about the, the robotic projects that create the uh, four-legged dog looking thing, that is an embodied project that has incredible mobility and the mobility is evocative and it has kind of projections about what kind of animal it is. And in fact, the fact that it moves in the world is so alive, right? It doesn't have the same pattern as, an, as, a, as a gothic story in which somebody's gloves start becoming ghost-like, right? It, but it has its own presence, and that presence is really recognizable. And again, we're wired to recognize these things. We know, we know where we see them. So whenever you're in, in the mix and you're thinking about a project that has bizarre combinations, think about what kind of power the stories have, what, what kind of power the objects have, and, and, the, and the question of presence, of what it means to actually embody something and, and see it in the world. So I'm going to go through some of this very quickly. The first ingredient was about being born adult. Uh, and this is extremely characteristic of artificial people. We always like these animation stories. They are about being um, uh, the, the exact opposite of the natural childbirth, right? Instead of a baby, you have an adult body. Time, you have an instant event. Instead of something that grows, you have something that already is visible, spectacular. Everything that's inside the body comes outside. And then you have fantasies of control in which you say, I push the button when the thing comes to life, instead of the absolute lack of control that people throughout history have felt about gestation, conception, childhood. The other thing that's important to remember about Frankenstein, and next year is going to be the bicentennial, so be prepared to have Frankenstein mania mm -hmm. for the novel, is that Frankenstein is not just about the making of people. Frankenstein is also about the unmaking of people. The fantasy, the, the, the story works really well as a, a modern story of origin because it actually has both the principle of we will make nature visible, we will hunt nature to its hiding places, and we will actually understand the miracle of bestowing life. And in a way, the story does it. Frankenstein manages to animate the monster, so something becomes at least done once. It's not necessarily knowable because it's very mysterious in the book, it's not necessarily replicatable. Um, but, you know, you do get the idea of like, ha, an ancient mystery has been demystified because you don't need gods anymore to actually animate people. You can do it in the lab. But a second mystery is emerging, which is a mystery of actual social and parental rejection, right? So to make people physically is not the same as to unmake them socially and culturally, which is what happens with the rejection of the monster and what actually motivates the rest of the action of the book. The, the part that creates such a lot of pathos and such a lot of commitment to that novel is not because we know what it means to be born. We actually don't, but we know what it means to be rejected. All the time we are aware of it, we, we, this is, it's familiar, and this is why, for example, the monster becomes such a figure of sympathy and such a figure of existential vocabulary. Of like, why, why am I not part of the human uh, fold? Um, so think about the doubleness of this, right? The making people and the unmaking people, and the way that those two combine in the book as something that creates this kind of negotiation. That because artificial people are born adult, they immediately land into prescribed, purposeful lives. By, contra by contrast, uh, the, the human is imagined as purposeless, right? You don't know what you're made for. That's exactly what you need to do as a thinker. This is what we have humanities for. Right? Like, what are we for? What are we here to do? 
Uh, this will be important when you see the new ghost in the shell, for those of you who follow these things, because it actually is a very existential quest in the original anime, where you have a, a voiceless flaneur uh, experiences, where she goes to the city and she seems to be looking at things. She seeks experience as experience, as if she's thinking about this artificial cyborg, as if she's thinking about what existence means or what it means to be alive. For cyborgs, for artificial people, that question never is out of fashion. In fact, it is so active, it's much more active than for the rest of us. They can never take it for granted. And that's one of the things that they actually embody. They embody the problem of the experience of experience, of the existence of existence. They are about existence as such. These are not things. Um, on the contrary, in the new movie, they are adding a kind of a corporate industrial military layering where it's like, who made me? What was I made for? And if this answer, if this is answerable, maybe the narrative gets paranoid and interesting, but actually it is a much more limited narrative than what was I made for as a big existential question to say what was I made for? Oh, it's these people who made you and that's the purpose and you're a secret agent and whatever and they stole your life. It actually personalizes that component and it makes it a lot smaller. Right, the scale gets to be a lot smaller in terms of existential quest. The second ancient ingredient is about mechanicity and the body, and body mechanicity. This is from an anatomy manual, which actually is using levers and ropes in order to understand the function of the arm and the muscles. In general, the, the idea that the body is already itself presenting experiences of mechanicity, it's not actually something that's new, it's extremely old. And it is something that was recognized by ancient philosophers because some of the elements of the body that do not seem to be under conscious control are also pervasive and, and wear a conundrum, a philosophical conundrum. How do you know if you're breathing? How, how, what does it mean to be, uh, to be double in this way where some things are related to will or a top-down command structure and some things are related to some other type of will that the body has, which is a bottom-up structure. Um, there was also a, a really long, long-standing question about the structure of sexuality and sexual arousal that for a lot of philosophers was like, and how does that work? Is this will or is this unwilled? If you are not, uh, you know, like you're not in control of it, but it seems to be in control of you in an active way, which isn't the same as blinking. Like my blinking is not in control of me in an active way. But sexual arousal seems to take over the self and that's a different category somehow, right? So it was really kind of fascinating. Um, and it feels to me that we are thinking about the, the inside and outside of these figures in these, in these uh, uh, interesting ways. Uh, I like the transfer that happens between um, thinking about something that might look robotic on the outside but has a sovereign ego inside. But Iron Man is actually a great example of something that is collapsing constantly because it is, looks like a robot, it actually is a human controlling it, but then inside the human there is also a kind of a technological core that powers him and that technological core takes the place of his autonomic body. It's fabulous, right? It's just, he has to actually do something without thinking. It needs maintenance, it doesn't work very well. Um, and then to think about the, the kind of uh, uncanny that is created in these kinds of images where what looks like a person is a machine inside, which also relates to modern dualism. Um, and then the pleasures of imagining a body that's indestructible, super huge, uh, that can put itself together again, um, that, that can have replaceable parts, right? Um, this for me feels like a really great uh, blind spot of the fantasy, which is the actual biological body is incredibly powerful. You're fighting pathogens every single minute. The idea that you can regenerate after a car accident is mind-boggling. No robot will ever be able to do that in that way. So, and in that way, that doesn't somehow need that much, right? You don't even need to have fantastic food in order to regenerate all of your cells. So, you know, somehow we survive. It's just amazing. It's such an interesting blind spot of like the imaginary, uh, industrialized, technological, overtly mechanical body uh, being stronger than, uh, than than the organic body. Interestingly, in terms of the des their design, most of these robot fantasies also completely uh, abstract all the parts that are gooey. Right? The middle of this, this should not exactly work in terms of function. This is too big of a torso, as an engineer might say. This is too big of a torso for this, these exact spaces. Like, these are too small of a hinge for this much weight. Like, what are they made of? It doesn't make sense. If you wanted to build that, you would say, we need some supports here. The supports we have are all the muscles, right? And the thing we are protecting are all of our interior spaces. So, this is very interesting fantasies. The modern ingredients. Talking about mechanism is not about the intimate experience of the body anymore, and it's not about sexuality, it's about control, much, much more in the modern sensibility. It's about mechanization and also animation and deanimation as political registers, becoming a subject, becoming an object. 
And then existential uh, fascinations are all coming out of the dualist paradigm in which we don't know if who we see are people or robots. And that is devastating. The moment that you say you don't know, it actually doesn't matter if they are people or robots because both the people and the robots are subject to the same ambiguity. Right? So it's a very paranoid cycle, and this is the one that I'm saying still has a lot of reference, a lot of uh, current currency. The story about slavery seems to be you know, completely standardized. Uh, you, don't, you actually need only two moves. The silence were created by man. At some point, the slaves uh, uh, um, decided to kill their masters. That's it. Rebellion. This is all the explanation you need in order to get to the beginning of the story. Right? It's, a, it's actually really, really standard. Um, there are some very important narrative assumptions in this scenario, and I'm going to think a little bit more about uh, maybe the connections with Marx here. Um, we assume in these types of stories, or the stories assume, that if they were ever to be invented in order to be workers or servants or slaves, those types of labor are very gendered. If they are female, they might be sexual slaves. If they are male, they might be modeled on artificial soldiers, artificial uh, workmen, artificial slaves. Um, of robotic slavery is that they can be perfect. They can be obedient, programmable, disposable, replaceable, uh, and all of the things that come from that, for example, that they could be unemancipatable or they might not unionize. Um, and then, if they become self-aware, you have two plot lines that are the basic plot lines. There's a third plot, plot line there that I'm not going to talk about today, which is that they demand civil rights or they rebel. The third plot line is actually that they are so abject that neither, neither one of these gestures is ever available. Right? And there is a state of objection in robotic narratives that is often really on the sides of the rest of the story. Both of these, in fact, are very sovereign gestures. It's actually a, a gesture of, uh, of, of uh, conscious and, and active ego writing oneself into history. Right? To demand rights is also writing oneself into the state. So that both of them are really sovereign gestures. The other state, the state of absolute the objection is really usually invisible in the stories, and you have to kind of retro engineer it. What are the ideological effects of this? If they are built as workers or slaves, in a way, the robots are part of that fantasy of the laborless world, right, that, that we are all critiquing today. Um, the assumption that the robot, the ideal robot, is unemancipatable should tell us a lot about the, uh, the, the core beliefs and the core desires of this discourse, the racist principles of the core desires of this discourse. The idea that programming would be something that ensures submission, right? And the idea that, uh, therefore, robotic servitude can only be in the absence of consciousness. A very false consciousness kind of Marxist narrative that a lot of these um, figures represent. Um, that if they knew they were slaves, they would rebel. Like, if they knew they were slaves. It actually counteracts everything we know about human slavery, in which people can be oppressed, abused, and tormented for many, many years, and they know that they are human, and they also know that they are slaves, and they know who's doing it. But the, the gestures of rebellion may or may not be visible or possible, right? Um, or the, the, the gestures of survival as rebellion are usually not part of how we understand this narrative. And in general, the thing that links robots to the, the narrative of enslavement is that robots by their very form represent a kind of political status that maps perfectly onto somebody's ontological status. Right? How you are made is what your position is in the political spectrum. Right? And when people try to think about this, I think one of the confusing issues is about what the robotic fantasy itself is. The robotic fantasy is not just a fantasy about technology in general. Um, technology in general, you can see here, the technology fantasies always get very old-fashioned. Um, so this is all about both control of important machines and about like, you know, the, robot, the mechanical makeup uh, artist, I don't know what's going on up there, um, but these are not personalized uh, appliances. Uh, the robotic fantasy is, in a way, something that both embodies the laborer and depersonates the laborer. The favorite example for those things is the automatic uh, uh, thermostat, right? It's a completely automated solution. Somehow it manages the temperature of whole buildings, but that is not a robotic fantasy. That's an automation fantasy, right? It's actually very simplistic, even for automation, but. Um, the robotic fantasy would have to uh, imagine it embodied and imagine it as doing the same job that a human would do, pretty much in the same way that a human would do it, but also not be human. So to embody and depersonate, it's just a very strange thing. Narratives of the masses and the individuals really play a lot uh, in this representation of labor. The infinity of labor, uh, the infinity of, um, of replication. 
slide that I added last night just because of the discussion we had yesterday. Um, that because, because the vocabulary is also always about that dream of a laborless world, you also have this incredibly racist background in so much of this stuff, or the way that it activates racial perspectives. In the beginning, this article says, uh, in 1863, Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1965, slavery will be back. We will all have personal slaves again, only this time we won't fight a civil war over them. Slavery will be here to stay. It will be mechanical slaves. Okay, so you want to do something about a robotic butler. Why do you need such an overt reference to slavery? And even if it is metaphorical slavery, why do you need Abraham Lincoln in there? So you don't mean it metaphorically. And so actually you do mean something specific about slavery. Um, most articles like this also at some point have a second component. Well, you can see that we started with, even if you just look at the illustrations, we start from something that is a science fiction illustration about a robotic butler. You start in something that is one of those fetishistic sculptural projects, amateur sculptural projects. That's what you see here. I mean, this is assemblage art. Let's not forget, this, let's not like, mis mis misrecognize that this is a robotic component. It isn't. It is robot in the same way that the stick figure drawing of a six year old is a robot. You can make that every day, Halloween especially. Um, and then you have like real scientific projects which actually are true and they have an effect in the world and they are part of real robust contemporary research of the time uh, about teleoperation and telemechanism. And then you often have this other gesture here. At the recent National Electronics Conference in Chicago, um, Curtis Schaefer, project engineer for the uh, whatever corporation, warned that tiny radios placed in the brain may someday make possible the control and enslavement of entire nations. <laughs> Schaefer said the control of man himself may be the ultimate achievement of what is known as biocontrol. But don't worry about this, you're going to have robot um, So This is actually another one of those things that we have to recognize as a very interesting gesture that again happens all the time. On the one hand, the robotic is imagined as the alternative to human labor. On the other hand, the robotic is actually a type of disruption in the space-time continuum, where the fact that there is robotic labor means it will become the standard for human labor, or it recognizes, if you were to do a matrix analysis, that the human labor is already roboticized. Right? It's like those things don't stay immune. You start off from the idea that you have an absolute difference between people and robots, and what the difference reveals is that the robots are people, and the people are actually already robotic. Um, this is a close-up of that machine, which also has its own gender vocabulary that, that is fascinating. Um, the person who wrote that article is not a hack. The person who wrote that article is actually part of a team, of two brothers, who wrote a lot of stories about science fiction in the 30s. Uh, including the first iRobot story uh, that Asimov then takes the title uh, of for his work uh, just, a, just a year later. Uh, and the stories are very overtly about bringing the vocabulary of rights and emancipation into the, into the, uh, the mix, uh, quoting or, or almost quoting people like we saw, and also creating a situation in which this particular robot who will never look human is always asked to do more and more things to save humanity from aliens, from fires, from tornadoes, and then he's always promised citizenship as his reward, right? Because it's actually impossible to give citizenship to something that looks like an appliance. Um, Asimov plays with this very differently because by the time Asimov makes his stories in the 40s and 50s and grants humanity to, this, to, to some of the artificial people, like Basset, in Bacentennial Man, for example, the people have also approximated a type of registering human uh, exteriority, right? And in the bicentennial man, also interiority, because if you remember the story, uh, Andrew is creating artificial organs. And so most people in his world now have artificial livers and hearts and lungs, and so does he. And so there's some biological difference that gets elided, not because it is an actual opposition that is metal, but because everybody has become a little biomechanical. Um, and then this is where that concept of thinking about what the robot represents. It's an extremely uh, uh, complex principle, right? That you represent something that at its exterior appearance uh, uh, registers both ontological and political status. Um, if, and the, the, the skin effects that we see for artificial people really matter. They're just an extension of the embodiment problem, right? The more, the more they look like human or the, the more they look like, um, like machines. 
when they have a human-like exterior, the artificial people are uh, often, that's where the narrative in, in cultural studies started thinking about race in relation to artificial people, because they could actually register human categories of racial difference. The replicants of uh, Blade Runner, for example, at some point, really clearly are an Aryan, and that was the criticism at the time, an Aryan imaginary, right? Uh, uh, an imaginary of whiteness. Uh, in some of the cyborgs of Battlestar Galactica, we also have people who are giving us evidence of human versions of different ethnicity and, and racial and ethnic difference. Or the narrative was about the type of hybridity that allegorized race by creating people that were mixed, half human, half um, or half human, half uh, machine. And so hybridity was uh, um, an entry point into thinking about notions of race. But in fact, I think that it is the most metal looking, right? So the, 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 count, the, the um, payoff of that argument is that here are all these people, you don't know which, are, which ones are people and which ones are cyborgs. And that is about the kind of ambiguity of, of difference itself. The beings that represent the, race, the racial component of the robot fantasy are the most metallic ones. Why? Because it is the most racist principle that you can do in terms of their design. You can see what they are just by looking at them. This has nothing to do with how racial violence is actually enacted. It has nothing to do with how people look, right? But it is the absorbing all of that vocabulary of exteriorizing political and uh, um, political status, um, and it exteriorizes it as if it is ontological status, right? So that's why it feels like it's a completely racialized premise. Um, in fact, what that logic also does is it basically gives us all of the great fantasies of the emancipatory gestures, where there's a type of subjectification, where uh, robots become people or objects become subjects. And what it undermines is awareness of the previous logic, which is they were people before and they were made into robots. They were people before and they were made into slaves. They were already starting from subjects and they became objects in terms of the law, but they're never objects in terms of who they are, right? Um, so something about the circularity of this, I think, um, it, it motivates quite a lot of the, the, the racial background of science fictional fictions of the, of the robot. Um, and you have to remember that there is a certain scale here where the vocabulary of mechanicity and the vocabulary of loss of self have a certain kind of range. So for example, to be a robot is actually pretty good still. You are embodied, you're individualized. Cool is a little bit less embodied and individualized. It becomes much more about usefulness rather than about presence. To be a cognitive machine is a much bigger loss. It's actually not even the whole machine. You're, you're just a tiny little part of it. And then, in a way, the modern sensibility kind of ends. And then we get to almost pre-modern fantasies and pre-modern precursors of the fantasy of mechanicity as loss of self. And that, that mechanicity as loss of self goes into being a power source being absorbed, being so abject that you don't even have an individualized body at all in the fantasy. The place where we see things like that um, is where, where we see the contrast between the modern subject-object logic versus the older, pre-modern ingestion or dissolution object uh, logic. This is something that kind of uh, was really surprising to me when I started working on this because it is as if the continuum flips, that like you cannot actually have that logic anymore. And it is a logic about being eaten, right? What is the previous model of the resolution of the self completely? And it is not a mechanical logic in antiquity. It is a logic about being eaten. Uh, and in contemporary narratives, we have it in terms of uh, humans being used as material or humans being used in a completely um, kind of instru instrumentalist uh, um, uh, way as spaces. So in the Mansa Galactica, there are women who are getting impregnated uh, to, to, for forced reproduction. In uh, the Matrix, we have people use as batteries, right? These are the, the only contemporary, or the kinds of contemporary places where you see that treatment of the human. We have a similar thing in Mad Max where the women are used to uh, produce milk. That's like the human body treated as material rather than as, as uh, subject. Um, and then these, I think, are some of the cultural contexts that are slightly changing. Uh, all of these vocabularies of compact competition, the idea, the focus on visible otherness, the focus on um, a kind of ontological distinction between human and non-human, these things are a little bit old-fashioned now. We don't really do them in such a racialized way anymore, even though I think the vocabulary of racial difference is really very active in the stories. Um, what, we, what we see is um, a kind of a conditioning or a revisiting of the conventions of these fantasies. 
For example, in something like iRobot, first of all, you have a very self-conscious, very funny, and very fluid recognition of the structural positions of those two figures. Um, the human as a position of sovereignty and the robot as a position of objection or objectification. And the flip of those to create a, a kind of a, a very, very white being in the position of structural blackness. American actor in the position of structural whiteness. Right? So the structural and the visible co contrast each other. Of course, Will Smith also is the kind of actor who can deal with this really, really well and who's extremely comfortable with, um, and in fact, uh, professional in figuring out how, how race will be played out in, in his dialogue, as his own people who actually do the dialogue of the movies or revise the dialogue of the movies. He has fabulous lines in this film, like for example, he has to take care of the cat of somebody who has died, and he says to the cat, I, you know, I can't keep you. This is not going to happen. I mean, you're a cat. I'm black. I don't want to be hurt again. <laughs> and that incongruousness is already kind of a very overt, uh, very, very um, flip and easy uh, negotiation with the fact that he's an African American actor in the film and he plays an African American policeman in the film. But it becomes so easy to stay in without making a big issue. Um, in the uh, iRobot, you do not have an us versus them narrative cleanly in ontological grounds. Some of the robots have been taken over by an evil AI, and they they glow a little red. I don't know if you can see that. The good ones glow a little. So you you know, and then you have the same requirement for visibility that we have in other stories. You can tell whose side they're on just by looking at them. Right. Um, the fact that the discourse produces these narratives of easy visibility is really very interesting to me. And in the end, what you have is some humans, the humans plus some of the robots fight together to liberate the rest of the robots from the evil AI. But it isn't a breakdown of the humans go here, the robots go here, right? It isn't actually, it's a very mixed vocabulary. The same thing happens in Battlestar Galactica. The human, some humans and some Cylons work together to fight other humans plus other Cylons uh, against, uh, you know, who, who wants to be isolationists. So you do, you do not have a breakdown on ontological grounds. You have a type of emergence of politics, right? Which is, which party are you on? What do you think we should do about this particular thing? It's a little more discursive and a little more interesting, I think. All of the erosion of these differences in a movie like Elysium. Elysium actually doesn't even, uh, doesn't uh, conform to the, to, the, to the vocabulary of us versus them because it actually uh, brings forward and literalizes just how much the us versus them is not at all about the robots. What you have in Elysium is you have a completely destroyed world, a completely horribly abused, environmentally destroyed uh, Earth, and then you have the uh, space colony, which is an absolute Eden. It's just un unbelievably beautiful, with all of these sublime images of seeing it from space and seeing space. And then this is what the Earth looks like. The Earth is, uh, uh, you know, uh, surprisingly very familiar, unfortunately, a very familiar picture from the news. Um, and all of the Earth citizens that have not really been allowed access to the Elysium uh, space are the, the, the lower classes, they are the masses, they are sometimes the workers, they are left to die, along with a planet that's left to die. They are also somehow the industrial force of this place, and they do a lot of very dangerous things and very dangerous occupations. In contrast, the world in Elysium is bright, and you have here, I don't know if you can see it very well, you have the people who have made this possible, which is robots, but the robots are, are always kind of standing by. They are uh, 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 very specialized. They can be policemen, they can be doctors, they can be medics, they can be just house assistants. But the robots here are actually not the problem, right? What the movie actually stages is the robots are standing by. In fact, these robots have such amazing ability that they can cure cancer just by putting somebody in a space special MRI machine. Somebody has to give them the command. That's all. It's not about whether you can, whether you have the will to do it, right? So the story is not about people versus robots. It's about people versus people. The robots are bystanders. The robots actually have the ability to do it. And what happens is somebody breaks into the central database, changes the code, and registers all of the people on Earth as citizens. That's all. You need one line of code, and you need to say all of these people on Earth are legal citizens instead of illegal aliens. Right? And the moment that gets rebooted into the system, the robots are like, what? There are 10 billion people who need medical assistance. And the system works immediately. They dispatch the medical uh, you know, uh, spaceships. They start fixing people. They, nobody even needed to.
to make that a command, a verbal command. They just need to change one line in the code. In a world of infinite technology, there is no labor problem here, right? It's infinite technology, infinite robots, infinite ability. Somebody just have to decide to do it. Um, so very interesting, a very interesting question about where we are. I, I have just a couple more slides. Um, the, we see a similar thing in Wally, right? Instead of thinking that the robots can actually do the work we should do, what you see in Wally is you see poor little Wally who's doing what he's designed to do, which is bucket bucket up the garbage and put it in a place. Wally will never transform out of that paradigm. <coughs> Right? He's making perfectly good tidy bundles of, of garbage and putting them in a space. He's fabulous. He also has a human hobby, okay? He loves human objects, he loves the little cockroach that survives on Earth. In order to replenish the Earth, in order to fix the Earth, you actually need both the functionality of robots and another type of action, which is human action. Right? You actually cannot let the robots fix it. The robots will not actually fix it. You actually need to make the humans reinvest. And in fact, the spectacle of robot uprising in Wally is not the robot uprising against the humans. It's a robot's uprising in order to restore a kind of a amazing human power, liberating people from their own acquiescence and from their own apathy. Right? So it is on behalf of people that the robots actually rebel. Um, I have a lot of different things about performativity and humanity. The one thing that I wanted you to know about things like Ex Machina is that Ex Machina is actually participating in one of the changes of that existential vocabulary because at the end, with Ex Machina, you do, don't have a pre, uh, prioritization of intelligence or consciousness um, or even, um, um, or, even or, 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 uh, or any of the aspects of the Turing test that the movie announces. At the end, what you have is an animalistic spectacle of pure survival. Right? And, and when I teach this movie, my students are very upset because they can concede that, yeah, Eva is pretty human, but she's a bad person. It's, it's bad. She should have helped this guy who helped her get out. She should have turned around for him. But the movie is actually uh, questioning if that is a very human thing to do, which is I'm out of here. In a, in a scene that is very resonant with something like Midnight Express, right? Somebody who has been abused, somebody who has been tormented, and who just finds a way out and gets out. Uh, or if it is registering her as inhuman to not show the kind of revelation of altruism, helpfulness, uh, um, uh, um, community spiritedness that we imagine somebody would have at that moment of after being abused for many years and living in a dungeon that they would step step around and help the person who helped them rather than getting out as fast as possible. But the idea that the movie privileges a type of animalistic component of survival I think would be useful here. Um, and then a similar thing happens with Lucy on the other side. Lucy is a much more rooted in dualism. It is about a person, a woman who ingests too many drugs. She becomes, not, not on purpose, but they break in her stomach. She's just a carrier. She becomes super intelligent. And super intelligence is related to being cold, looking at the world and saying, oh, I see, you're all having your tiny little lives. And I am, you know, I'm able to see time and space very differently. All of that stuff. It has a matrix notion here where she can see the before and the after. And, all of that, uh, right? She becomes, in a way, cerebral, right? And then at the end, by the end of the film, she has basically become a kind of carbon-based computer machine, which is a new kind of computing entity, and she can see things, and she can uh, understand everything. And this is where that quote comes from that I started from the beginning. Where is she? She is everywhere. Her body has now become the environment. So I have to stop here, but I think that there are some interesting questions to ask about whether some of the persistence of these plot lines actually uh, uh, help us understand the, the, both the interactivity between reality and fiction, but also the longevity of fiction and its really f incredible functionality in these vocabularies, both in the actual cultural productions and cultural narratives and even in our everyday life. Thank you.